Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Peterborough City Church. Great to have you again this Sunday morning as we finish off our mini-series on 1 Peter. I hope you've been enjoying it and finding it informative. Before we get to that, we do have a few announcements. We want to say thank you so much to those who have given. If you'd like to give, you can e-transfer to ptbocitychurch at gmail.com. And if you'd like also making out a check, make it out to Peterborough City Church. There are pens and envelopes at the back in baskets as well. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe on YouTube, hit the bell for notifications, and send to all of your friends. At the end of the service this morning as well, we're going to, try, we're going to take a photo because, you know, all the, all the chairs are set up so nicely that uh, we're going to move the prompting screen off to the side. So we're going to leave everything set up for a moment and take a couple of photos because some of you might say, this would be a great photo. So we're going to do that this morning. So at the end of the service, don't tear anything down yet. Wait until we take a couple of photos. We'll scooch that to the side. So that was a great idea. Other than that, we don't have any announcements. So do you know what time it is? It's time for Exploring Bible Knowledge. All right, everybody, are you ready for question number one? Question number one is... What is sanctification? What is sanctification? Let's see. Is it... The process of the believer being progressively transformed by the Lord into his likeness? Or... Is it the process of separation from one's earthly culture to the heavenly kingdom? Or is it conformity to church traditions? Or is it the avoidance of unclean food, drink, and behavior? What is sanctification? Lots of ones? <laughs> we have a two? <laughs> And lots of ones. All right, let's see. The answer is... Yes, the process of the believer being tra progressively transformed by the Lord into his likeness. Question number two. Question number two is... Who is the main driver of the process of sanctification? Who is the main driver of the process of sanctification? Let's see. Is it the apostles? Or is it church leadership? Or is it traditions? Or, <laughs> you're ready for four, are you? <laughs> or is it the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Lots of fours. Am I making this too easy? <laughs> Let's see, the answer is absolutely right. It is the Holy Spirit. All right, question number three. Question number three is what does it mean to be obedient to Christ? What does it mean to be obedient to Christ? Let's see. Is it to follow the Ten Commandments? Or is it to do your best to be a good person and don't associate with sinners? Or is it go to church, read the Bible, and pray? Or is it love one another as Jesus loved us? What does it mean to be obedient to Christ? Are you sure? <laughs> All right, let's see. The answer is... Absolutely. Love one another as Jesus loved us. Let's see how you do with question number four. Question number four is... What does it mean to be sprinkled with his blood? What does it mean to be sprinkled with his blood? Let's see. Is it we are responsible for his death or 
By faith we have accepted his atoning sacrifice and are cleansed from sin, or we are part of the Jewish nation, or we are living sacrifices pleasing in God's sight. What does it mean to be sprinkled with his blood? See a two, we see a couple of twos. Couple twos. Some not so sure. All right, let's see. The answer is yes, by faith we have accepted his atoning sacrifice and are cleansed from sin. Well done. All right, last question. Question number five. Question number five is what does the peace of God do? What does the peace of God do? Let's see. Is it, it guards our hearts, or it guards our minds, or it transcends all understanding, or all of the above? Was that a little bit too easy this week? <laughs> Maybe. Let's see. The answer is absolutely all of the above. Well done, everybody. Give yourselves a hand. And that has been Exploring Bible Knowledge. Very good. We're going to make it a little ch more challenging next week for you. I'd like to invite the band if they would come back and join me at this time. And as they do, why don't you stand as we prepare to celebrate and worship. It is so nice to have Steve back after some holidays. Yes. So nice to have him back. Really appreciate that. Well, maybe I should wait until after the service to say that. <laughs> Reading from Psalm 126, it says, Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Though Christ was dead, now surely he is risen. Yeah, he is coming back again. And Christ will reign in triumph forever. Yeah, all praise belongs to Him. Yeah, all praise belongs to
Bless God in the sanctuary. Bless God in the fields of plenty. Bless God in the darkest valley. And every chance I get, I bless your name. Bless God when my hands are empty. Bless God for the prayers that cost me. Bless God when nobody's watching. And every chance I get, I bless your name. Bless God when the weapons for me. Bless God when the walls are falling. Bless God cause he goes before me. And every chance I get, I bless your name. Bless God who holds the victory. Bless God cause he's always with me. Bless God cause he's always with me. And every chance I get, I bless your name. chance I get, bless your name, oh, oh, oh yeah, every chance I get, on and praise the Lord with me, sing if you love His name, come on and
no shadow there is hope should oceans rise and mountains fall Thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for all that you do for us. Your absolutely incredible sacrifice. God who loves us and reaches out to us. Who has a plan for us to prosper and to bless us. Lord, forgive us for our sin. For not believing in your love for us. For not trusting in your love for us. 
Give us the courage to have faith. Give us strength to die to self. Open our eyes to your sacrifice on the cross so that we too can know that it's okay and not be afraid to let go of things we feel we need so badly. Lord, we need you in this world. You are the God who understands. Jesus, you are the high priest who walked with us and walked this path so you do understand where we are. And so, Lord, let your grace continue to be poured upon us until that day that we are with you. Heal us in body, heal us in mind, heal us in spirit, Lord. And even in our frailty, may we be a light in this world that others may find the grace and the mercy that you have given to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, band. It's great. So nice to have keys and drums today. Wasn't that nice, full sound? Yeah. Such a busy schedule, and it's hard to, between work, etc. Uh, but it's just so great. Uh, when you, when you do make it and when we have musicians here, and, uh, it's just, it's wonderful. I love that. So we'll have to, we'll have to grow the band a little bit and, and uh, maybe one day a choir. And, wouldn't that be fun? See Jeff Vandermeule and say, yes, I can't wait to join the choir. <laughs> but until then, we are continuing on in our series in First Peter. Over the past two weeks, we started a look at Peter, at the history, the authorship, uh, what it means to be an elect of God. Last week, we looked at the meaning of exile. What it means to be in exile, what it means to be scattered, living in a foreign land as we become citizens of a heavenly kingdom no longer belonging to this world. We are passing through, but meant to engage in deep, meaningful relationships. Part of the diaspora. God planting seeds in this world to bring love, joy, and peace to those around us. To usher them into the kingdom of God by faith as well. We have purpose here. We looked at the region to which Peter was writing. The amazing move of the Holy Spirit. Planting churches in that area far, far earlier than we had ever expected. Right from the very day of Pentecost. It says that there were some Jews from Cappadocia. There on the, out, the day of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And right from then, they brought that back to Cappadocia, up in the area of Turkey, with them. And so when the apostles arrived, they already find churches. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? All apart from what they were doing, they go and already find Christian churches. So that was exciting to look at that last week. But um, this week we pick up from verse 1 into verse 2. So reading from verse 1. Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Love that opening of the letter. Now this week what we want to pick up in that opening is the Trinitarian formula. Did you notice it? D did you notice the Trinitarian formula? It says God the Father, work of the Spirit, obedient to the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Like boom, boom, boom. Right there. And remember Peter is one of the earliest letters. And here we have this formula already embedded in the traditions of the early church. Long before the doctrine of the Trinity was finalized, the scripture spoke to it. The early church leaders, who were all monotheistic Jews, they alluded to it. Like Peter just did in his letter there. See, there was the belief that God is one. And that was firm, 
You couldn't shake that. Christianity is monotheistic. Yet, they saw God as the Heavenly Father, confessed Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and recognized the Holy Spirit as a person, an individual, who was also God. And although there was no formula, formal formula, to describe the reality of the Trinity by then, which later came known as the Trinity, <laughs> even though they didn't have that word back then to describe it, it was there. So if everybody tells you, you know, the, the word Trinity isn't in the Bible, no, but what the Trinity speaks to is. The Trinity is in the Bible. What it speaks to is there. And they were simply, remember that the writers were simply describing the revelation that was delivered to them. They were not inventing something. They were recording the revelation that was delivered to them. Even as it struck their reason with difficulty, they were faithful to the revelation and they were faithful to the experience as they received it. You know, as the, as the early church people started reading this, going, well, hang on a minute. The scripture is saying that there's one God. The scripture is saying Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit's God, God the Father is God, but it's not three gods, it's one God. And they didn't change that. They left the revelation as it was. Even though it challenged their reasoning. Yes, this is a challenge to reasoning, and it was hotly debated for many years, trying to figure out how this works. And the reason that it was hotly debated was because the revelation presents this three yet one. If that's not what was in the scripture, they wouldn't debate it. They wouldn't have debated it. Were it clearly just one, you know, it's just God the Father that's God. If it was clearly that, were it clear that Jesus was not fully God, or that the Holy Spirit wasn't fully God, it would not have been so hotly debated and poured over and poured over and poured over. But because that's what they saw in the Revelation, they had to grapple with it. As challenging as the Revelation presented in Scripture was, notice they didn't manipulate it or change it to make sense of it or to make it logical, which is what we would have expected, right? If you, if you read something that doesn't seem to make sense, wouldn't you change it for it to make sense? No, they didn't. They did not change it to make more sense. Because they recognized this was revelation and this was prophecy. Think of some of the prophets and the crazy things that they said. You know, we, we looked at Ezekiel 38 and 39. And if you read it back then in those days, you would have thought this is craziness. These nations will never go to war with each other. So did they change it so that it did fit the nations of the day? No, because they recognized that this was revelation. They recognized the prophetic voice. And even though at the time they didn't understand it, they said, we hadn't better touch it. We better leave it. This is how God delivered it. Same thing with what Peter is saying here. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so they let the experience and the revelation of God remain authentic and raw, just as they received it without alteration. And this is shown very early in the letter of First, period, of first Peter. The Trinitarian revelation and experience of God was there right at the beginning. It wasn't something introduced later. It was also something endorsed by not only Peter, but endorsed by the entire Christian community. Remember, these letters were received as authentic within the churches and the communities they were written to. Remember Silas, right? That brilliant scholar who was co-authoring this letter with Peter. He had no objections to this theology of three. Silvanus could have said, Peter, wait a minute, you know... <clears throat> kind of making it sound like there's three gods here. We should change that. Don't word it like that. He could have said that. But he didn't. Their other companions could have said that. But they didn't. Why? Because that's how they understood these things. There was no objection to this theology of three. 
There were no objections by Paul, or James, or John, or Apollos, or Zenos, right? The lawyer and fellow travel, traveling evangelist who accompanied Apollos, right? Not only did the early church leadership accept this Trinitarian writing, but the writings were accepted into the canon as authoritative. There were many, many, many opportunities for the community of Christ and the leadership to pull this language out. Not only here in Peter, but in other places as well. But they didn't. Why? Because that's what they believed. Christian theology and scripture were not decided upon by one individual, but by many. These were group decisions. Any revelation or word from God was always tested and approved by the group. As it says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. It says, you must understand this, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. This is community-driven. Community-driven. Have you ever wondered why I quote from the commentaries? <laughs> Have you ever wondered that? Actually, a friend of mine, he'd come out to church a few times, and one time he says to me, he says, Chad, why do you, why do you quote from the commentaries? You, you just want to make yourself sound smart? And I said, no. I said, I know that I say some pretty stretching things, some pretty challenging things. I include the commentary so that you can see these aren't Chad's crazy thoughts. <laughs> these are thoughts from a community of tested and tried scholars. It's not just my crazy thoughts. This is why I quote from the commentaries. To show that many others who are learned scholars in the scriptures have come to the same conclusions on these certain scriptures. It's not my own private interpretation. And if what I discover and how I'm interpreting it lines up with proven biblical scholars, it shows me I'm on the right track. Remember when we used to do our Bible studies and we would, we would do those exercises and exegesis and walk through that process of how to study the scriptures? That's the same process that all the people in the commentaries, the scholars in the commentary follow. They're even written like that. They have their word studies, their breakdowns, they do their exegesis, and then they do their exposition, their interpretation. It always follows that pattern. Hmm. So if I've discovered what I'm discovering in my process lines up with the biblical scholars, I know that I'm on the right track. It's exactly how they wrote the letters and the Gospels of the New Testament. Did you know that? Hmm. And if what I've discovered doesn't line up with the community of scholars, then I've got to find out why then I have to discover why. This also makes it very important to use commentaries that have a board of editors and contributors from many denominational backgrounds to avoid bias or to discover bias should it be there. If the only material we read is that which our own denomination will endorse or if the material we read is material that we already agree with, then we'll become narrow-minded and likely misinterpret the scriptures. It's very important to read material that we don't always agree with. A good friend of ours, they were, they were over at our house one day and on the shelf, I have that book, uh, The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins and God is Not Great by Christopher Hitchens. Um, I have one by John Dominic Crossett, God, and another one, With or Without God by Greta Vosper. I, I don't agree with them. But especially this friend of ours who's, who's an atheist, he sees Dawkins and Hitchens and he goes, um, Chad, why do you have Dawkins and Hitchens on your shelf when you believe in God? And I said to him, because if the only material that I'm reading is material that agrees with me, how would I ever know if I was wrong? You wouldn't. And that goes the same with everything. With politics. If all we ever read and study is what we agree with, how do you know 
but there isn't something good from the other side. How do you know if what you believe really is correct? Same thing with world religions. I was actually asked, uh, I was the assistant pastor in a church, and uh, I wanted to do a series on world religions, and the senior pastor said, well, why would you want to do a series on world religions when what you, you already believe the right religion? And I said, how do you know? <laughs> Have you studied the other religions? How do you know? And maybe there's something that they could add to it. Yes, I believe Jesus is who he is. Yes, I believe the Bible is inspired by God. How does this work with everything else? And it's only fair that if I'm asking people and encouraging people to believe in Jesus, listen to what the message of Jesus, and then they say, well, why don't you list, listen to what my religion teaches? It's only fair, isn't it? So both in my bachelor's degree and my master's degree, I took world religions, and I assure you, Christianity is the best. <laughs> that is my humble, incredibly biased opinion. But after studying the other scriptures of the world religions and their philosophies and the worldview, I can, I can say with deep, deep confidence, Jesus is the way. Absolutely. And so, if all that we're reading is material that we agree with, or that we mostly agree with, or already agree with, we can become narrow-minded and likely misinterpret the scriptures. And what is truly amazing is, I see how many of those commentators from the wide variety of denominations do agree on the interpretation of a text. I've come to the point now when after reading some of the scriptures on a passage, I'll, I'll get to the second or the third, and they're all saying the same thing, so then I just stop. I don't bother reading the rest, because they're the same. A friend of mine, we were over in Barrie, visiting friends at Christmas time, and we were chatting a little bit about this, and he said, you know, it's, interpretation is so difficult, you know, you can interpret things, you know, different things so many different ways, and I said to him, you would be shocked. You know what I discovered when I started studying you would be shocked at how similar all of the commentators are. If there's anything that's different, that really catches your attention because it's unusual. It is that unusual. I am shocked, and I'm still amazed to this day, at how alike they are. And then I said to him, I said, listen, how difficult is it to interpret a stop sign. When you come up to a four-way stop and you see a stop sign there, everybody stops. It's not open to interpretation. Well, maybe not Steve, right? It's actually <laughs> like, no. <laughs> it's just a suggestion, right? We all know what it means. It's not open to interpretation. And so, language, yes, there are some challenges in interpretations in some scriptures, but generally speaking, the nature of language is it, we communicate ideas that are quite accurate. If not, we couldn't do this this morning, you couldn't build buildings like this, etc. and so on. Interpretation is pretty solid for the most part. Yes, some things are open to interpretation, but most isn't. And you would be amazed at how alike the major commentaries are on Scripture. The major publications, right, are the Interpreter's Commentary, the New Interpreter's, the Expositor's, the Anchor Yale, the New International. And so you get all of these, and you've got every single denomination represented in those commentaries. Poetically, some of the authors say things differently. Oh, just like the New Testament writers. Just like the Gospel writers. Poetically, they say things differently. You can hear their personalities in it. But they're saying the same things. Poetically, they'll say some things different. Or maybe one will bring out a detail that another didn't bring out. But I'm amazed how they don't contradict each other. For the most part. For the most part. Sometimes they'll take a different take on it. But generally speaking, I am shocked. 
And the contributors from these commentaries are multi-denominational and have a multi-denominational editorial board. You must look for that when you're looking for material. This is the same process that you have to look for very carefully in the letters and the Gospels. It's the same process that happened back then. It wasn't Peter who just said, well, I'm going to write this letter by himself and say, well, I'm Peter the Apostle, so I'm going to write this and send it out and everybody's going to have to believe what I say. No, that is not how it happened. He sat down with Sylvanus, they wrote it together within the community, they incorporated community formulas and phrases into the letter. It was done by a group. Peter, as he's writing, opens up with a common ground teaching among the churches. Teaching they would have all recognized. Those phrases and those lines that Peter is saying, people would have known. This wasn't new to them. This is formulaic. We read a lot of this in Romans and in Corinthians. These formulas that people, the Christian, early church would repeat in churches, language that became familiar to them. And so Peter opens with those words. The people recognize those words and phrases. The churches he's writing to begins to read that opening. They will witness the authenticity and the Christian character of those words. It's exciting, isn't it? There's a lot going on in these few verses and in the letters that we're reading in the New Testament. Okay, moving on to this phrase in verse 2. Where it says, 1 Peter 1, 2, it says, You who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. That phrase, who have been chosen, is not there in the Greek. It's not there. It's added in the English so that it reads more smoothly. It's not wrong, but it's simply referring back to that word elect, which we looked at in our first message of the series. So just to give you an idea of some, some of the things that are happening in the language there. In verse 2, it picks up directly in the Greek by saying, 1 Peter 1, 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Foreknowledge means just that, to know beforehand. You were God's elect, which he knew beforehand. God had his eye on you a long time ago. He knew you would respond to the move of the Spirit in faith. And so all of God's plans had you in mind. All of that. Remember God doesn't, God exists outside of time. He sees everything. He went, if I, if I'm long-suffering, with people, if I suffer and die on the cross, if I die and I rise again, go through all that pain, oh, this means that Emily will be with me for eternity, eternity just as I thought. Yeah, that's worth it. It's worth it. Simon will be with me for eternity if I go through all of this. Yeah, that's worth it. And so will Eldon. Well, I don't know. <laughs> yes, even Eldon. <laughs> but it's true. God looks at all of us. He looks at you, thinks, yes, you're going to be with, if I go through all of this, and therefore, this is the foreknowledge that God had and says, it's worth it. It's worth it to go through all of this. God knew you would respond to the gospel of Jesus and place your faith in him. As mentioned in the first message, Peter is reminding the people in the churches that they are God's elect, which he foreknew, which he meant to encourage them and to comfort them in their reality. And just as God saw that they would respond in faith and become one as his elect, God also saw that there would be times ahead for many, many, many of them. And tough times. There would be tough times. It's important for us to remember being an elect of God does not mean the absence of pain and difficulties. But he sees you in your pain 
he also sees you at the end. He sees you in eternity. In Revelation 21.4, where it says there's no more pain, no more suffering. He sees that. He sees us in our pain and suffering now, but he sees us in the joy at the end. And it's all worth it. See, faith in God does not mean that life will be all happy and trouble-free. God doesn't promise freedom from difficulties, but God does promise to be with us through our difficulties. And just as God foresaw our coming to him in faith, God saw the difficulties we'd face and encourages us by saying, I saw it, I still called you, I've got you. This is the foreknowledge of God. And what you don't see yet is the end. You'll get it. Once you get there, you'll understand it. Then the next phrase that Peter uses in the next two verses, he says, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. What does it mean to sanctify? Well, you got it right in Exploring Bible Knowledge, but we'll say it again. The word sanctify is the process of advancing in holiness of the believer being progressively transformed by the Lord into his likeness. I like that. Progressively transformed into the likeness of our Lord. Doesn't mean we're there yet. It's a process. It's a process. And throughout history, and even today, people have had their own ideas of what sanctification should look like. What is holiness? What should holiness look like? Some have thought our outward appearance should be part of our sanctification, our holiness. Therefore, plain clothes, head coverings, absence of jewelry, these are all seen in some communities as, you know, signs of holiness. Some behavior avoidance, like smoking or drinking alcohol, going to a movie theater or a pool hall. You know, see, they became to be seen as something a holy person would never do. I remember going to Bible college and some of the rules were, well, very silly from my perspective. Uh, we weren't allowed to drink alcohol. I did. Um. <laughs> well, see, there it is. Like, no. <laughs> I'll get it. Anyway, uh, you weren't allowed to go to the movie theaters, which I did. Uh, you weren't allowed to hold hands with a member of the opposite sex on campus. But off campus, <laughs> or nobody was. And the reason you weren't allowed to hold hands is because holding hands leads to sex and pregnancies. <laughs> well then. <laughs> so, you know, consider the, consider the thinking, right? Consider the thinking behind this. And we must be very careful. Well then, it wouldn't it make sense that even looking at a woman could lead to sex? So then maybe, if we really want to be holy, we should have the women cover their faces and their entire body with a sheet and allow only a, a slit to see through. See where we're going? See how it happens? Mis misunderstanding what holiness is. Not understanding what true holiness of God is leads to such oppression. And notice, it's typically the women who suffer the most under holiness rules. It's awful. What are our ideas of holiness? What do we picture the process of sanctification to be? What crazy rules have been forced upon others in efforts to categorize this process of holiness? It's all wrong. It's all wrong. Completely wrong. First of all, holiness is not something that we can do. It is part of the work of the Holy Spirit. It says, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. Sanctifying work of the Spirit. No effort on our part can do it. We can't produce it or force it on somebody else or make another person conform to it. What insane damage has been done by all religions forcing others to conform to a pattern of holiness they say is required by God? Who came up with the insane idea that women should be covered head to toe, including their faces, 
in the name of holiness? How did we as humanity come to such things? I had a friend in high school, after I became, and became a Christian, right at the end of high school I became a Christian, and so I got to know this, this girl, and she was um, from a very fundamentalist Baptist church. Women were not allowed to wear pants. Because that's not holy. Seriously. God would be upset. If women wore pants, apparently, <laughs> according to this church. So what she would do is she would keep a pair of jeans in her locker at school. She'd come to school, go to the bathroom, change into her jeans for the day. Yeah, there you go. See, some of you know exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. And I, you know, and I thought, good for her. Good for her. How many of you are thinking similar things that you've seen over the years? Silliness. A misunderstanding of what sanctification is. Sanctification is a process the Holy Spirit does, not us. And it can't be driven into someone by what they wear or where they go or what they eat or what they drink. It comes from the inside out. The Holy Spirit does the work inside of us and it manifests on the outside. So then the question is, what does Holy Spirit sanctification look like? It looks like Jesus. What is the definition of sanctification? A believer being progressively transformed by the Lord into his likeness. Sanctification looks like Jesus, who is love. Jesus, who is non-judgmental of others, who embraces everyone regardless of lifestyles. Jesus, you're eating with sinners. Jesus, you're, you're friends with tax collectors. Jesus, you're going to Samaria. Jesus, you're talking to women. Jesus, you went to Phoenicia. Jesus, you're going to the Decapolis and on and on. You are not holy. You can't be a rabbi. No, 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 no. You misunderstand what holiness is, Jesus says. You, understand, you misunderstand what sanctification is. True holiness is love for one another. And our churches have failed at responding to the sanctifi sanctifying process of the Holy Spirit because of a false perception of what holiness is. And as a result, we've built up walls dividing between us and them. And there's nothing Christ-like about that. The process of sanctification calls us to what? To love one another as Christ loved us. I love John 13, 34. I've read this before. I'll read it again. Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. That was very, very helpful for the early church that was struggling with what Old Testament laws and rules and traditions are we supposed to follow and which ones are we not obligated to follow anymore. That's why that's there. I give you one command, to love one another. As I've loved you, you must love one another. That's it. And that's why Jesus said that. The process of sanctification is revealed in how we treat each other. Are we kind? Are we tender-hearted? Are we forgiving? Are we gracious with one another? Just as God, for the sake of Christ, was towards us, are we patient? Do we envy? Do we boast? Do we keep a record of wrongs? Do we protect each other in our faults? Or do we blab it to the world? This is love. Are we selfish and greedy? Do we harbor bitterness and jealousy? See, dealing with these issues, that is the process of sanctification. Becoming more like Christ. And it all has to do with our inner disposition, how that inner disposition affects our behavior towards one another. And this is why it has to be a work of the Holy Spirit. Only God knows what's going on inside of us. And only God can change us. No amount of outward conformity can change our heart. No amount of outward conformity can change our heart. And as Jesus calls out the religious people of his day, he says the same thing in Matthew chapter 23. He says, Woe to you teachers of the law and the Pharisees, 
You're hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside's full of greed and self-indulgence. Outside are all those traditions. Outside is all their, you know, they wear the right clothes. They say the right things. They, they fast when they're supposed to. All of that stuff is on the outside. And Jesus says, yeah, but on the inside, you're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisees first clean the inside of the cup of the dish, then the outside will be, will be clean also. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees. You hypocrites, you're like whitewashed tombs. Look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. On the outside, your life looks really good, Jesus is saying. You look like you're holy people. People respect you, but on the inside you're dead and you're unclean. In the same way, he says, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. The process of sanctification is a work of the Spirit that happens inside of us and manifests as love towards one another. That's it. That's it. Nobody likes sanctification. Do you like it? I don't like it. I'll tell you why. Because the Holy Spirit points out our innermost thoughts and desires. And he says, that's not right. You need to trust me with them. You need to let that go. You need to trust in me and let me make you clean. The Holy Spirit points out areas in our lives we need to die to self and trust God with. And that's hard. Hmm. We yield to God in faith, giving up those things that we've set our hearts upon, and those things that we've set our hearts upon, that's what's driving our jealousy, driving our greed, driving our insecurity, our selfishness. In refusal to be kind to each other, our inability to forgive one another, that which inhibits our ability to love one another. Peter recognizes this process of sanctification is happening in the churches he's writing to. Their love for one another is evident as they continue to grow in the Spirit. Then the third part, the last part of this Trinitarian greeting in verse 2. Who knew there was so much in a few verses, right? Isn't this neat? We're almost done. Good thing you're in a comfy pew, right? The last part of the Trinitarian greeting in verse 2 says this. To, the, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. As we've already read, the only commandment Jesus called us to follow in obedience is to love one another. And again, how many Christian communities have created rule upon rule upon rule? It's ridiculous. It's like they've never read the Bible. You wonder, eh? It's like they say they believe in Jesus then completely ignore the one command he gave us to love one another. Don't overcomplicate it. If we aren't teaching and treating each other in love, we are not being obedient to Christ. And then he says the phrase sprinkled with his blood. And the sprinkling of blood has three references. There's three references to the sprinkling of blood in the Old Testament. Exodus, when Moses renewed the covenant with the Israelites at Sinai, he sealed the covenant by sprinkling blood from two young bulls on the fellowship offering for the people. The second is a reference to the blood, sprinkling of blood used at the Jewish sacrifice for a person who converted to Judaism. And that's the one that Paul's referring to. When he's saying, you've been sprinkled with blood. When a person converted to Judaism, they had the sprinkling of blood for the person who converted to Judaism. Interesting. Then the third one is the Day of the Atonement. And again, another reference to our salvation. Once a year, the priest would sprinkle the blood from the sacrifice on the mercy seat. The blood was to atone for the sins of the people. You've been atoned for, Peter's saying. All this is taken care of. So these are the three references of sprinkled with his blood. It is Christ's blood shed once for all, making atonement for the sins of humanity. Peter's reminding them that they're covered by the blood of Christ, their sins, their faults. It's all gone. It's all washed by Christ's sacrifice. So that's what he means when he says, you are sprinkled with his blood. That would have been a common phrase among the Christian community. Have you been sprinkled with his blood? Yes. Wonderful. Have you been sprinkled with his blood? Common phrases to re reinforce teaching. And so are we. We're sprinkled with his blood. We've been forgiven. We've, the atonement is made. It's wonderful. You've been sprinkled with his blood. 
communion not next week but the week after so the weekend after the, after the long weekend so not the long weekend because I know many people are away for the long weekend so the weekend after that in September we are having communion so we'll just have to uh, oh, you'll all rewatch these videos on Peter for communion right <laughs> well what a mouthful in all those verses and then he says grace and peace be yours in abundance I like how Elmer Al Homerhausen said in 1 Peter, right there, he says, we can never have enough grace and peace. I like that. We can never have enough grace and peace. Grace for ourselves as we navigate through the process of sanctification. Grace for others as they endeavor to do the same thing. And peace, which this world seems all too uh, efficient at robbing from us, Something so powerfully restored deep within us by the Holy Spirit is a peace that endures forever. Well, I think that's everything for the verses today. I'd like to invite the band. If they would come back at this time as we prepare to close in song. Why don't you stand with me as we prepare to do just that. Now you're going to have to help me on this one. All right, you got to clap with us now.
Good job, everybody. Well done. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen. God bless you, and we'll see you next week. Oh, yes, the photo. Yes, so if we can leave everything set up here and just uh, wheel the uh, screen aside there to this, um, or down or over here. And so leave everything set up for a minute and we'll take a photo.